Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Search Engine Strategies that will Supercharge Your ROI. My name is Eliana Raggio and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by DealerOn. And for anyone who isn't familiar with DealerOn, well, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency. And we're best known for our search engine optimization best-in-class customer service, and our award-winning websites. DealerOn was named the top-rated website provider by driving sales in 2012 and 2013, and DealerOn customers were winners of the Spring and Fall 2012 Digital Dealer Website Excellence Awards, including the highly coveted Overall Winner. And recently at NADA, DealerOn also received the Best in Show Award for website design from Dealer Marketing Magazine. DealerOn is so committed to lead conversion, optimization, and customer service, that we're the only company in the industry to offer a money-back lead guarantee program. So, does your website company guarantee you leads? Well, then maybe you should check us out at DealerOn.com. And we have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have Duncan Scarry as our presenter today. Duncan Scarry is the CEO and founder of Haystack Digital Marketing, one of the very few Google AdWords premier SMB partners in all of North America, and the only SMB partner that started out as a full-service automotive advertising agency. Duncan is a nationally recognized authority on automotive digital marketing. With over 15 years of successful offline and online advertising experience, Duncan offers dealers and manufacturers insight into the most effective, progressive automotive marketing methods. As CEO and founder of Haystack Digital Marketing, he leads one of the fastest growing automotive digital marketing companies in North America, serving the nation's top dealerships and dealership groups. Duncan's passion is strategically combining the strengths of traditional and new media to increase automotive retail sales. Duncan is an avid traveler and he can be reached at duncan at haystack.com. And by the way, just in case you hadn't heard it, Haystack Digital Marketing has awards too numerous to mention, but three recent and most notable ones are before you now. Haystack was awarded a Google PSP Award 2012 for highest customer satisfaction across all verticals. In addition, Haystack was recognized as a finalist in more award categories than any other single provider. Haystack Digital Marketing also earned top honors as a top-rated multi-channel advertising solution for auto dealers in the 2012 Automotive Website Awards. And the huge independent research firm Forrester conducted an extensive evaluation of big management platforms and concluded that Haystack's bid management solution was the sole leader in that category. Lots to think about. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, don't worry, we're going to respond by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of the webinar recording will be emailed to you later today for your reference, and please feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at Haystack are giving away a really cool prize today on the webinar. What is it? One lucky attendee is going to win a Nexus 7 tablet. Yes, from Haystack Digital Marketing. It's a $200 value, and you have to be on the live broadcast to win. All you have to do is stay tuned for the details after Duncan's presentation. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to receive a short survey, so fill it out because we're always looking for great feedback from you, our valued audience. And today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. So let's get started. Let's learn the search engine strategies that are going to supercharge your ROI. Duncan Scarry, it has been far too long, my friend, since I've had you on the show, and I'm so glad to have you back now. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here, and uh, it's always fun doing your guys' webinars and uh, getting a good bunch of people on the line and uh, going through some uh, some strategies and some uh, tactics that people can use to uh, help improve their performance. I mean, honestly, I don't know if there's anyone who's even better suited than you to have a webinar like this about this subject. And I'm just going to warn everyone on the show, it is really, really good, and there's some really, really great stuff in here. So. Try your best to pay attention. I know you're busy, but really, there's some great stuff in here you're definitely going to want to hear. All right. Thanks, Eliana. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, a couple things here today, um, and uh, I think uh, they're really important to, to, to uh, talk about the landscape of the, digital, of the automotive digital uh, marketing space. 
um, is really important to set the stage for a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, towards the end, which are maybe some specific ideas or strategies. I think a lot of times people who've seen me speak two or three different times see similar slides or the same slides pop up in all of those presentations. Um, and, uh, and the reason they do is, is because I think there's some really important foundations that are critical to understand um, for people, um, you know, when they're making these advertising decisions. So um, specifically when we talk about search is that, you know, consumers have taken to search at a much more rapid rate uh, than I think even the industry anticipates. And if you look at um, what's gone on in the past six years, uh, there's been a tremendous increase. Here's, here's a chart that shows the monthly searches in billions. Um, now, the reason we pick these six years is J.D. Power has a statistic that says the average car that someone's trading in at a dealership today is, is six years old, 6.2 years old. And so what we're doing is we're trying to show a, an idea here of what's happened in the past six years. Um, now, one of the examples we give a lot of times um, revolves around how businesses market to consumers. And if you take a, like a consumer product, like let's say orange juice, over time, as people's tastes and needs from a, from a product like that changes, um, the, the marketer can change their messaging. Uh, people buy orange juice every single week, and so uh, a marketer can adjust their message slowly over time. Um, what's interesting in the automotive arena, though, is that the purchase cycle is so big and so long that um, the way someone interacted with us the last time they bought a car from us and the way they're interacting with us today is drastically different. And I think the mistake that I see most dealerships make is not to identify how quickly the industry is changing and quickly change their tactics. And something, that's two, something that a dealership did two or three years ago um, might be completely outdated today. Um, the latest statistic that, that's been presented by a company called Comscore is that there are 174 billion searches uh, every month. And when you look in the news and you look at things about the deficit and budgets and you know, search queries, and these numbers really, you know, they kind of defy imagination. So to put in perspective how big 174 billion is, is if you were to count one to 174 billion and get out one number every second, it would take you 4,500 years to count to 174 billion. And so the example is that that's the time if you started counting one, two, three, uh, at the time they started building the pyramids in Egypt, um, you would reach 174 billion today. Um, and so that puts in perspective uh, the amount um, and the frequency which with people are searching today. It's, a tr it's just a ridiculous. Uh, an amount of people that are in, that are querying the search engines uh, on a monthly basis, and so sometimes these numbers, when you put 174 with a B after it for billion, uh, it really starts losing perspective as to how much search is actually going on in the world. So we're going to have a um, an example here um, of not only the volume uh, but the targetability of search, which I think is really really important. So Ileana, if you could pull up the first poll question. Um, is if somebody goes to Google and they type in Toyota Camry, uh, what percentage of those people are going to be looking to buy a car, sell their Toyota Camry, or service their Toyota Camry? So that's the first poll question that uh, if Ileana, you could put that up. It's up, it's up. So everyone, if you could please look at your screen. And uh, Duncan was already kind enough to read the question for you, but I'll do it again. So of the people <laughs> who type Toyota Camry into a Google search, what percentage are looking to buy one, sell one, or service one? What's your guess? So please select one of the following answers. Is it less than 25%, between 26% and 50%, between 51% and 75%, or do you think it's more than 75%? So of the people typing in Toyota Camry, how many are looking to buy one, sell one, or service one? And we have a majority of the votes already in. Thank you, everyone, so much for participating in our poll question. We're going to have a few more poll questions coming your way, too. So sit tight, because they're going to be fun ones. And we still have some more people voting. This is awesome. Almost everyone's voted now. But I'm going to close the poll. 
and share the results. Are you ready, Duncan? You want me to share the results? Absolutely. They're kind of shocking. All right. So with almost everyone voting today, a majority of today's webinar attendees, 46% in fact, of today's webinar attendees think that more than 75% of people who type in Toyota Camry into Google are looking to buy one, sell one, or service one. More than 75%. Uh, I don't know if that's true. You're going to tell me the answer in a minute, right? Um, uh, I'm not. Uh, it's really an opinion question. I'm not. I don't think there's uh, the, the 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 idea here is a little bit of an exercise to show some targetability, and I think that number is probably right. Um, if you look at this, is that if we're as a dealership, what are the three things that we do? We sell cars, we buy cars, and we service cars. And so, the majority of people on this on this webinar think that 75% of the people who type in Toyota Camry into a search engine are looking to buy a product or a service that is the primary business of a dealership. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I want to put in perspective is um, the most watched television commercial all year, every year, is the Super Bowl. Uh, and last year, 36% of Americans watched the Super Bowl. Um, that's the highest rated show on television, has always been, with the exception of the final uh, show of MASH, which I think happened in the in the early 80s. Um, and I think that the Super Bowl has become like a marketing icon for advertisers to place ads in. So if you do some math here and you say that there's going to be 19 million cars sold in the U.S. this year by franchise dealers, you know, 12 million new and 7 million used, and you divide that by 12 months, and you multiply that by 0.36, which is what uh, the number of people that uh, watch the Super Bowl, 4.6% uh, of the people who are going to buy a car from a car dealership this month would have viewed a Super Bowl. And that shows the inherent lack of targeting of television. That if you run an ad in the Super Bowl, which is the highest rated show on television, 4.6% of the people, uh, it only reached 4.6% of the car buyers. Um, the average local television commercial only reaches 1.5%. And so what we have here is if you use that math, a television commercial, the average television commercial reaches 0.12% of the people who are going to buy a car from a car dealer this month. And if we go back and take all of the attendees' opinions that 65 or 75 percent of the people who type Toyota Camry into a search engine are a Toyota Camry shopper, and that an ad on television reaches 0.12 percent of the shoppers, it really puts in perspective um, how targeted search is as an advertising medium. So when you look at this, you look at the evolution of dealership advertising, um, these numbers uh, we present every year, these are one year newer, however is in 2001, 53% of all dealer advertising went into the newspaper. And in 2011, the internet has taken over as the primary advertising outlet for auto dealers. Um, now what's interesting is if you look at all of the other mediums, radio went from 14 to 16, television went from 15 to 20, mail went from 6 to 9, um, that a lot of the other mediums haven't changed much in their distribution is that the internet has taken over um, and ha taken over newspapers dominance in the auto industry. And so um, a lot of times we show this number and we ask our dealerships, um, do, do you intend on being average, right? Because this number here, 25% of dealer ad spend going to internet advertising, um, that's the average. And that means the really smart dealers who are spending 35 and 40 percent are average with the dealers that are behind the times that might be spending 10 or 15 percent to come up with this number. And so we always ask our dealerships, if you intend on being average, you should probably devote a quarter of your budget to digital marketing. The other element here that's really important, if you saw that chart in the first slide about how fast um, Internet usage is growing, um, NADA, these, these numbers come from NADA. This is the 2011 number. Right? We're in 2013, and so um, I fully expect that this Internet number is only, has only increased and increased quite a bit. Um, so I think that the average right now in 2012 might be 27 or 28 percent. So I think it's really important to look at um, you know, how, the, how this trend has affected dealers. So 
Now here's the frightening thing, the numbers. These come from Burrell, Burrell and Associates. Burrell and Associates is um, the uh, largest local online media research company. And they predict uh, dealer spend to grow at a staggering pace. Right now, they predict that there is $1.69 billion uh, spent on search engine optimization and search engine marketing by dealers and $4.3 billion in total uh, on digital marketing. Uh, and when you look out into this trend, search engine marketing is going to increase, display is going to increase, and video is going to increase. But this market really from all sources, really the, the spend that dealers are pushing towards digital mediums really is only increasing uh, over time and at a really, really rapid pace. And again, this goes back to the point that um, if dealers haven't updated their budget, their digital ad budget in a year, um, they're probably falling behind. And I think that's really important that to make sure that we're doing the best we can with our digital, uh, our digital marketing. And this, the, you know, all of these figures, um, you know, we're going to talk specifically somewhat about search, but all, there's a lot of outlets to put your digital dollars in, and they're all very good. They range from your website company, which DealerOn happens to do a great job, uh, search engine optimization, um, auto trader and cars.com are important elements, search engine marketing is an important element, um, and so when you look at this, it's important that you guys constantly tweak and push um, your digital marketing budgets and try to keep them uh, growing as fast as the market itself is growing. Um, everyone's heard of the zero moment of truth, or I hope everybody's had this, heard of the zero moment of truth, uh, and we've spoken quite a bit about it. To kind of recap, the zero moment of truth is something Google actually kind of stole. Um, Procter & Gamble came up with a concept of what they called the first moment of truth, and that was that inside a store, inside a supermarket, if we go back to our first example of orange juice, Procter & Gamble makes Tropicana orange juice, if we go back to our first example, um, Procter & Gamble learned that when somebody goes into a store and decides to buy orange juice, how the orange juice is positioned on the shelf, the carton, that was really important into their, their decision-making process. And so they created a position called the Chief First Moment of Truth Officer to work on the in-store experiences with their products. Um, Google had difficulty showing how digital worked with products like cars, where people research them online and purchase them offline, uh, because there's a giant disconnect in data. And so they did a real uh, large-scale research study which showed how influential each of these mediums are, and they called it the zero moment of truth. Um, and how they came up with that is that today there's another interaction between a consumer and the product. The first is they are exposed to it through an ad, through a referral from a friend, the zero moment of truth is the first thing people deal with these days right now is go online. Whether it's a restaurant, whether it's an automobile, whether it's travel, the first thing they do is go online and research the product or service. Then they go into a store and interact with the product in the store and then they purchase it and go home. And a lot of times some people actually go into the store and then go back to the internet and purchase the product. And so the zero moment of truth really is an effort to show how influential the digital uh, mediums are on that purchase process. And um, this is a pretty cool chart that was illustrated in, in that study, which is usage and influence are two entirely different uh, concepts. And that people use a lot of television, they use a lot of radio, however the ads that they hear on that are not as inherently influential as some of the information that they find online and information that a consumer gets from a dealership is even more influential than that what they find online. And so that when you look at this, a lot of traditional advertising has very, very high usage. In the top left corner, you can see the usage is 86%. And that when in the auto shopping process, 86% of the people use offline media, offline advertising as a source of information. But it is only influential to them 29% of the time. Online, they use online 97% of the time, and you can see it is substantially almost twice as influential. And I think what's really important here is to understand the difference between usage um, and influence. Um, so when you look at this, this is the, the concept that I've always said is a little bit frightening for auto dealers, is that in that study, 
they treated every interaction that they had with a customer as a media point. And the most important reasons that someone buys a car, Eliana, is? Their dealership experience. No? Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> well, it's the car itself. Um, and it's the same reason why a large Toyota dealership, if it became a Suzuki dealership, would have less sales volume. That the primary reason someone goes to a dealership is to purchase a product. Um, and the product is the influencer. So that's the, that's the frightening part of what we look at in a dealership. And that in this chart, they show every influence that that encourages someone to purchase a particular product. The yellow are online. The light blue are things that a dealership can't control. And the dark blue are things that a dealership can control and are offline. So if we ask people to pick one area where they thought they could be the most influential, in this chart, it would be the yellow. And obviously, that means that the internet is highly influential. And to give you another perspective on this, um, and um, is the JD Power report on influencing uh, factors in automotive purchasing. Um, this breaks it out into people who are using, who are not using the internet. That's labeled as non-AIUs. People who are using the internet, AIUs, and people who are submitting leads. And the item here that is kind of interesting is the internet is actually more influential in a person's purchasing pro uh, decision than what their friends tell them about that, that, that dealership or product or service. And that's a pretty interesting number. So Ileana, I'm not going to step on your toes with poll number two. I'll let you, but this is where we'd like to go with uh, poll, number, poll number two. Okay, let's do it. Poll number two on its way right now. Okay, everyone, if you could please look at your screen. We have another poll question for you. We want to know what's going on over at your dealership. So when you're at your dealership, is the primary performance metric that you focus on cost per conversion? So if it is, put yes. Maybe it's not, put no. Whatever the answer is, we're curious. And once we get a majority of the votes, we're going to close the poll and share the results. And Duncan, just so we're talking, you know, apples to apples, or, you know, since we're talking about orange juice, oranges to oranges, um, cost per conversion is how do you in this in this consideration we're only going to talk about cost per conversion being a phone call or an email gotcha okay so is that <laughs> i'm getting a lot of people writing in is is that um how you uh is that the primary performance metric that you focus on when you're thinking about how to spend your ad money. So uh, we have most of the votes in already. Thank you so much for participating in our second poll question. And we're going to close this poll. Oh, still more votes are coming in. We're going to close this poll and share the results. Are you ready for this? Yes. Duncan, 55% of today's audience said no, but 45% of today's audience said yes. Well, I think that's a you know I'm much happier hearing that response than you know you put these questions out and you anticipate an answer, and uh, I think that makes me feel much better uh, about the audience in the sense that um, the reason we ask that is that we really believe that the internet is an influencing medium and not a direct response medium, and I think that's important that when we make the currency of our investments the number of phone calls. Uh, or emails that our campaigns generate uh, that we miss the point is that a lot of people go online with the intent of remaining anonymous with the intent of not calling a dealership but they use our digital marketing they use what they find on AutoTrader they use what they find on, um, on our website they use what they find in a search engine to help them make a decision without ever contacting the dealership and so when we advise our customers as to what metrics they need to look at um, cost per conversion or cost per call or cost per email is actually lower down the list of things that we want to focus on. And I think that we really want to, um, you know, have our, have our customers help, uh, you know, apply a little bit more of a subjective, um, you know, a subjective uh, viewpoint to the, how they uh, determine if their digital marketing is working. And we'll get into a little bit later about how you might want to do that. But uh, actually, the answers to that question make me feel pretty good about our audience here today. So. Oh, well, I should also tell you that Grant wrote in, one of, our, one of our attendees wrote in, we're in the Stone Ages. Sales are the mm -hmm. only thing that upper management tracks. So I, yeah. I don't know. Is that, that, that is the, 
<laughs> the Stone Age, you shouldn't look at sales. You should look at other factors. Uh, I think the important thing is 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 that's the holy grail, and that that's the reason Google came up with zero moment of truth. If you're Amazon, and somebody searches for a book, and they get to Amazon, and they put two books in their shopping cart, and they take a take a book out, and they leave Amazon, and they come back, and they pick that book up, and they buy the book, and they pay for it with a visa, and they have it shipped overnight to their house. We know everything about what they did. That it's very easy to tie the behavior to the sale. And the difficulty in the automotive industry is that is not the process. That people leave the virtual world, the digital world, and they walk into a dealership. And not being able to connect the two is, is, is reasonably frightening for a dealership. Is how, how do we know how to spend our money if we can't connect them to sales? And kind of the joke that we make with a lot of people is that there's a lot of things that we accept as fact, like um, what other planets are made of um, or what stars are made of based on, on, on theory, right? You know, we look at uh, how light is reflected off objects on the Earth, and then we look hundreds of light years away into space and assume that, that something else is made out of that same material, and we shoot men and rockets out into space. Um, so people accept um, circumstantial data much more often in today's world um, than dealerships do when it comes to digital marketing. And I think that comes on to item number two, which we've got a big bottle of snake oil here, is that it's... Um, Did you draw that? Because that's, that's mad skills right there, Duncan. Did you draw it that? It is. It's, and it's not just snake oil. It's snake oil 2.0, which is better than the first version of snake oil that was on the market. And the, the real difficulty here is that... Um, I have a couple of examples here, and I'm going to try to mask some of the names in here. So... Um, we were sitting with one of our customers who is the digital marketing manager for a very, very large automotive group. And um, we were at Digital Dealer, and they pointed across the room, and they said, yeah, we're trying something with that company over there, but their, their platform's in Java, and so it won't optimize very well. Mm. And that's just not a, a – that's what, what the, you know, the application framework is. It has nothing to do with search engine optimization. But somewhere along the line, that person was educated by a salesman, miseducated by a salesman. And a lot of the people that our, our dealers are listening to for advice aren't the people. They're, they're the best social marketers, not the best advertisers. You know, if you go on driving sales, one of the top posters about search engine optimization is someone who's got about 200 blank Twitter accounts tweeting information back and forth to help get SEO rankings, which isn't inherently a good idea nor sustainable. And the difficulty is in, in an industry where people um, don't know what to do or don't know what to buy, um, it's really easy for uh, snake oil salesmen uh, or people who just know a little bit um, to sell um, the products and services and confuse the customer. And so if you really want to do a good job, you need to be an educated consumer or find a trusted partner and let go. And I can't tell you how many times that someone calls us up and asks to make changes to their account um, because they heard something at a conference, which was generally nonsense. If you look at I don't want to um, get ourselves in a whole bunch of trouble here, but if you look at conferences, <laughs> the people who speak are the highest pay, are the people who pay the most um, at, at the conference, right? Um, the people who uh, are educating the world on search optimization are people who post the most on social media, not necessarily um, the best educators for industry. And so I really think that people need to um, either really dig down and find that education and find that education from an independent source or find partners that they can trust and just let go. Um, so I think this is uh, maybe a little bit more common sense, but uh, something that's been pretty important for us in the last couple of weeks is we've seen a couple, um, we've had a couple of customers have some really odd questions and recommendations. And, you know, the industry, um, you know, there's no, no easier person to sell something that, to than a salesperson, right? <laughs> so um, I want to dig into a little bit about search engine marketing and how it works. And there's a reason, because I'm going to get down here a little bit, um, that a lot of times our customers don't entirely understand how search engine marketing works. And so um, the keyword that 
you see in your search engine reports is not often what someone types in when our ad shows up. And I think that most of our customers typically don't understand that. When somebody types in, uh, if you're targeting the keyword Honda Accord, um, depending on how you type that in, how you're, how you're marketing for that, if you look on the right-hand side where it says query example, everything in the first four boxes is something that would get your ad to show up. Even down there at the bottom, Gullwing Motorcycle and Toyota Camry. Is that if you're targeting the keyword Honda Accord, that theoretically, when someone types Gullwing Motorcycle, Toyota Camry, Craigslist used car, Craigslist used cars, your ad could be triggered. Now there's a lot of tools that search marketers use to help mitigate that. Um, you can match keywords by exact, which means we're targeting exactly what someone types in, phrase matching, uh, which means that, that that phrase appears in a search, uh, broad matching, uh, broad match modifying. And I think when you look at this and, and you see the complexity of just how a keyword matches, uh, you, you start to see how a consumer um, can be confused. And so I'm going to move on to um, an example of, uh, cost per, of how cost per clicks are calculated. And Ileana, um, this is an area where you can do, I'm not going to step on your poll question again, but if you give me <laughs> one more, uh, take, your, take your poll question and uh, put it out there and we'll go through this. <laughs> you can read the poll question if you want, silly. <laughs> no, I, I got, I got, uh, I got uh, admonished for. Uh, no, absolutely all not. Questions. I just, you know, I'm only here for a couple of things, and that was one of them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. True or false? A higher bid equals a higher ad position. True or false? Let us know, because I, you know what? I actually don't know. This is one thing I have no experience in. I have never bought an ad. And so I'm really looking forward to finding out how this all works because I know this is a source of frustration for a lot of, of uh, you know, internet managers and and people who you know buy those those ads. And uh, I don't know if um, I don't know if they know the answer. And not every not everyone who's on here today has voted the same way. So with a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And Duncan. 76% of today's audience said false. A higher bid does not well, equal a higher ad position. Well, that's fantastic. That is absolutely true. But one of the things that we encounter all the time, which is, well, just move me down a position and I'll spend less, or um, just bid me up because I want to be into a better position. Um, and this is something that I think is really critical for people to understand. Um, is that you are, and, and I think if everybody, this would be a good time for, if you are a note-taking person, this is the time to write this down because uh, we're going to use it a little bit later. But um, the way a cost per click is calculated is, um, which in the case of advertiser A is $1.50, they take what's called your quality score. Every keyword has a quality score. And they multiply those two together. And that equals your ad rank. And then what happens is advertisers are sorted from the highest ad rank to the lowest ad rank. Now here's the interesting thing about our cost per click is that the cost per click is only calculated between you and the person behind you. The entire rest of the auction doesn't matter. So to come up with the cost per click, what they do is they take the advertiser who is below you, their ad rank, they divide it by your quality score, and they add a penny. And I know this is some really, really confusing math, but it's really important for people to understand because there's a lot of different ways that people can achieve better cost per clicks. So they can achieve better conversion ratios. And understanding this is really important. So if you look at the, in this scenario, the advertiser E, who actually had one of the lower bids, is actually in, posi in the first position and they're actually in the first position for a lower cost per click than the person behind them. And so really the, the focus here um, is to talk about quality. Okay? This doesn't mean that the person in position three shouldn't be buying that keyword. It just determines how valuable it is. So again, if anybody wants to write this down, how you calculate a cost per click is you take your quality score 
times your bid, and that equals your ad rank. Advertisers are then sorted by their ad rank from the highest to the lowest. And the way your cost per click is calculated is you take the ad rank of the person behind you, you divide it by your quality score, and you add a penny. And so this is really kind of interesting because when we get into some of the later stages here, this is going to make some sense to you. Um, a lot of people will talk about the bid management. And there's all different ways to manage bids. Uh, for example, uh, if it's your dealership name and you always want to show up and you always want to show up on top, uh, there's a way to bid for that. There's a way to bid uh, simply to increase or lower the cost of your calls or your conversions. There's ways to bid into particular positions. There's dynamic bidding uh, that adjust bids based on inventory um, or um, values or something like that. But this is where we're going to come into what I think is one of the biggest lessons um, it, about what can do the, what can you can do to improve your search ROI is that strategy drives search ROI, not technology. And you probably find that funny coming from a company that touts its technology, <laughs> but there's absolutely nothing that our software does that a human couldn't do with a calculator and a pen. All right, what our software does is allow those calculations to be done faster and with more accuracy and more often than someone could do it on their own. But there's nothing in any search platform, in any digital marketing platform that you will find that can't be done by people. So when the snake oil sell salesman tells you, hey, this is our secret sauce, uh, we can't show you the keywords because that's how we get this really low cost per click, um, we can't show you this because um, you know, we've got this technology that nobody else has. Is all of that is absolute BS. Is that the strategy you employ drives your ROI, not the technology. The technology simply allows you to maintain your strategy and stay course more effectively than you could do with a pen and paper. The the example I always give is like the stock market. Um, the stock market is going in the direction that it's going regardless of any individual investor's efforts. Um, and what an individual investor is trying to do is they have a strategy. I want to be conservative, so I'm going to buy bonds. And I'm going to have a lower return on investment than if I bought, let's say, an index fund. Someone else may say, well, I want to take some risk, and I want to try to um, invest more aggressively and make more money. Um, the simple fact of the matter is those strategies are ways that you go to the market to invest. Um, there's no super secret strategy. There's no super secret technology. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, the stock market, something like 90% of the money managers don't beat the S&P 500. So when people do attempt to beat the system, typically they fail. And that the strategy you employ is going to drive your search ROI, not the technology. And this is, this is a slide that has a wealth of information on it. And this is from a panel of about 600 customers. And what we looked at is the keyword performance by type. Okay? And so on the left-hand side, you'll see the buckets of keywords. Brand terms is the brand name of the store, or terms that relate to that. Regional terms are typically the franchise in the region. Model terms are model-specific terms, uh, Toyota Camry, uh, without any um, brand term associated with it. Franchise terms are terms when somebody's looking for the franchise that you represent, but not your individual dealership. Competitive terms are when you might be targeting uh, a competitive product, and there's just a slight detailed model terms, and that's just something we broke out there. But what's important to see here is that a lot of times, you know, people say, why would I bid on my own brand name? I'm just wasting a huge chunk of my budget. And the simple fact of the matter is that the metrics of search are not linear. And what I mean by that is that when you see a cost per click, that doesn't mean all your clicks cost that. That is the average. The number of clicks divided by the total cost is that some clicks cost $0.25 cents and some clicks cost $10. And that when you break it out into these categories, you can see the distribution not only of traffic but of conversions in cost. So if we look at this, brand terms typically drive 31% 
of a search campaign's traffic, yet they only cost 11% of the budget. So you're really not wasting that much money. In this example, this average dealer, these dealers were spending on average $2,400 per month on search engine marketing. So they were only spending 240 of the $2,400 on their name. So buying your brand name is incredibly efficient. It also converts very well. Even though 31% of the traffic came from the brand name, 39% came from conversions. 39% uh, of the conversions came from the brand name. Regional terms, 25% of the traffic. Model terms, 23% of the traffic. Franchise terms, 19% of the traffic. Now what's interesting though is you see model terms were 23% of the traffic but 39% of the cost. And this is where we get to our next question is everybody who's, me who's measuring from a cost per call methodology is this is where we go wrong. Is our belief is the better job you do at digital marketing, the higher your cost per call goes. And the reason is, let's take a dealership's average budget. Let's say a dealership that sells 100 cars per month has a $30,000 budget. That seems like a pretty average number. It's $300 a call, a car. And that's the way we all do our math. We take, a, we take our average budget and we divide it amongst, um, amongst every car we sell. But the simple fact of the matter is it didn't take $300 in advertising to sell every one of those cars. As a matter of fact, if you're a dealership that sells 100 cars and has a $30,000 ad budget, if you stopped advertising entirely, you wouldn't stop selling cars entirely. So let's say, for example, if you stopped advertising, you might sell 70 cars. And in this scenario, your ad expense is actually $1,000 per car. And the reason is because it costs a lot more to convince somebody to buy a car from you than it costs to convince a prior customer to buy from you again. And so when we look at this, um, if I were a nefarious search marketing company, I might focus on buckets one and buckets two, which are brand terms and regional terms. And then I'd turn around and show you that I got $15 per call and what a great job I did and how my technology really rooted out the keywords that actually worked. If I were a good advertiser and your friend, I might actually tell you to go after the model terms and the franchise terms, which are the most expensive cost per call. And the reason is those customers are the least likely to be your customer. And so what I'm doing is I'm converting somebody who doesn't know who you are, who isn't searching for you, into a contact. And taking somebody that's not going to be a contact and creating and turning them into a contact is much more valuable than taking somebody who wants to call you and taking credit for it. So the concept here is which is better, $12.50 per call? and 45 cents per click or $67 per call and 424 per click. The fact of the matter is you can't tell. And this is digital marketing metrics are quantitative, not qualitative. That a low cost per call might actually be a lower quality of customer. There's somebody that's already going to buy from you. There's somebody that's using a search engine like a Yellow Pages. That actually a higher cost per call might be a more valuable or higher quality of customer. And so I think that's something that's really important to understand. So let's go through our key takeaways. The digital is an influencing meeting, an influencing medium, not a direct response medium. We need to look at how our advertising is influencing people and it takes a leap of faith to do that. You need to be an educated consumer or find a trusted partner and absolutely let go. There is so much sales and so much salesmanship and so much misinformation in the market, it would frighten me to be a dealer trying to figure out what digital marketing products and services to buy because people will sell anything. Strategy drives your digital marketing ROI, not technology. Everything that every digital marketing company can do for you can be done by hand, okay? Nobody has some super secret technology that makes things work differently than the next person. All of the publishers, the search engines, give everybody the same access to the engines. Technology does not make it work better. It allows you to employ a really good strategy. And digital marketing metrics are quantitative, not qualitative. 
and that a low cost per call isn't inherently mean good. High cost per calls could sometimes be incremental customers that you're not finding anywhere else. And so those are our key takeaways to look for to have people you know look at their di digital marketing, particularly search, and try to make some decisions um, that are better. And so Ileana, I think at 12:45, which you told me to speak for 45 minutes, we have 15 minutes for questions. <laughs> So I am spot on. You are awesome, Duncan. That was a really, really spectacular presentation. Thank you so much. And we do have a lot of great questions coming in from our audience. Certainly, if you have a question for Duncan's Gary from Haystack Digital Marketing, now's the time to send it on in. Before we get to your questions, though, we have a little bit of business to take care of. Yeah, we're going to be giving away a really cool prize. So it's that time. If you were with us at the top of the show, heard me announce that our great friends at Haystack Digital Marketing are giving up a really cool prize today. I wish I could win one, <laughs> but only one lucky attendee is going to walk away with a Nexus 7 tablet. So all you have to do, all you have to do is answer a simple question about the presentation you just saw. So get ready, get in front of your keyboards, you're going to need to be in front of your keyboards for this. First one to write in the correct response is going to be walking away with this amazing prize today. And this is not a lay down question, by the way. This is a little tough one. This is a tough one. It's a very cool prize, so it's a little bit of a tough question. So uh, I want to wish everyone good luck. And Duncan, would you do the honors and read the question for us? <laughs> All right. Uh, so here we have five different advertisers with their quality scores and bids. And the question is, which advertiser is going to end up in the first position? And what will their cost per click be? It's a two-part answer. So don't just send me who you think is, is in the first position. I need to know who's in the first position and what their cost per click was. All right? I don't have a correct response yet. And you know, Duncan, you did say that, that uh, it would be tough. It's definitely tough. I, I did. I, I'm getting... I, I, did. I think it, it might be too tough, and we can always fall back to, to another, another answer here. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm getting very few people with the right uh, advertiser in the first position, and I haven't had anyone who got the, um, the correct cost per click price yet. So I'm still waiting. <laughs> I don't know how long should we let this go on. <laughs> uh, I, we, Do your calculations you again, you everyone. Do your calculations again. Check it out. It's kind of like you've got to do all five, right? You have to do all five first. Yeah, you, have to before do you all can figure five. out. Yeah. So um, uh, oh no, I still don't have a correct answer. You're more than welcome to, to you know. Send me another answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let, let's go down here and do this. Why don't we just say, and there's something that you can do very, very simply on the screen, is who, which one of these advertisers is simply going, uh, simply going to end up in the first position? And uh, you, you have a 20% chance of getting it right if you just type a letter. Well, I think what we were, well, I mean, we've had people who, who guessed that. But um, I think we were going to do, um, put the, the advertisers in order, the five advertisers in order. Yeah, is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, put the five advertisers in order. Okay, everyone, since we have not gotten a correct response yet, put the five advertisers in order. A, B, C, D, E, D, B, C, A, E. I have no idea what the answer is, but we're going to figure it out. <laughs> you know what? That reminds me. I actually don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I only know what the first one is. Um, you're going to have to send it to me in the chat. I don't know what the answer is. All right, it is. Let me see if I can get the chat here. <laughs> I'm really surprised, though. I thought it would be closer than this. There's hardly anyone that even has the first one correct. Out of all the people that wrote in, there's only one, two people that have the first one correct. I think that's where we're, we're losing it. That's surprising. All right, Ilya, and I, I'm sending to you right now, and I okay. hope I don't chat it out to. I hope I don't accidentally chat it out to everybody. I know, right? <laughs> okay, let me just double check my answers that I have here, and see if we have a winner yet. <gasps> we have a winner! No, we don't. I messed up my B's and my D's. Err. <laughs> we don't have a winner. <laughs> 
we're not even close. Wait, I take that back. We have a winner. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad we have a winner. <laughs> I know how to read the alphabet. Okay, our winner, congratulations. It's Art Simino. Art Simino, you are the winner. Why don't you show everyone the answer, if you wouldn't mind? All right. Okay, the correct answer for the first question, which no one had the right answer, was D, and it was $2.68. And as you can see on the screen, the correct answer is D-C-A-B-A. -A. And Art Simino, you are the first person to write in that correct response. Thank you so much, Art. If you wouldn't mind, please send me your mailing address so we can have Haystack Digital Marketing mail you out your Nexus 7 tablet. Congratulations, Art. Phew, I was sweating bullets over there for a sec. <laughs> I was, but you know, it's, I think it's also a good example that, that illustrates how complicated digital marketing can be and why it's sometimes very difficult for consumers or dealers who are purchasing it to understand uh, that these type of calculations are something a, a digital marketer has to do every day. And this kind of, it's a really good illustration as to the the, the difficulty and, and why it's so hard sometimes to, to make good decisions with all the bad information that's out there. I was really surprised that D was not a popular answer. Most people were putting mm -hmm. A, B, or E, and D was just not in their thing again. Real quick, can you just go over, I mean, because obviously uh, I would have failed this test too. <laughs> what What is the, is the, um, the formula again? The the ad rank is quality score times bid. So you see advertisers A's quality score times bid is 12, B's is 10, C's is 16, and D, 6 times 3 is 18, and E, 4 times 2 is 8. And so that's the order that they end up in. And then what you do is you take the person behind you's ad rank, divide it by your quality score, and add a penny. Again, very complicated calculation, um, but trying to make an illustration of a couple things. One, higher bids don't always bring you higher, and there's quite a bit of sophistication to what people need to do to help manage their digital marketing. Wow, that was that was great, and I, I feel like it. <laughs> it was like a mental Olympics over here, and that was just one little tiny thing. Let me ask you something: they have to do this kind of a formula for every term that they want to buy? Well, that, that, that's where we talk about um, the technology really being a strategy implementation, that you have to understand how this works, and then uh, the search marketer who's running the campaign can tell the system, if A happens, do B. If C happens, do, you know, do D. And uh, increase this 10% to attempt to get it up one position. So all of these things can be done by hand. The technology empowers you know our our digital marketers to who understand this information to lay out uh, goals and timelines and tasks to achieve our customers goals so uh, people someone on our team really would have to understand this to operate here on a daily basis okay I have to tell you Duncan we're getting a lot of people who are writing in saying please email me the formula can you show me the formula again would, would you mind terribly going back to the slide that has that formula on it so that people can maybe copy that down once again and it was funny too because I know that when we were on this I was like pay attention people this is important because <laughs> well, I knew I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it, it's complicated enough that even presenting creating the comment the, the, the that that um, creating that slide, uh, I had someone proofread the work for me because it's complicated enough that you can get it wrong at any time, right? Right. So here's what you do is every keyword has a quality score and every keyword has a bid. And you multiply the quality score times the bid and you end up with what's called an ad rank, okay? Then the ads are sorted top to bottom by the highest ad rank to the lowest ad rank. To calculate the cost per click, you take the person below you. So E's cost per click would be 13.5 divided by 7 plus one penny. Now why do they do the one penny? Just so you can be above the next person, right? Uh, just it, it actually it separates the calculations because you in that math you could end up with uh, two bids that are exactly the same. 
oh. two calls per click that are exactly the same. So. You're right, you're right. Okay, um, well, I hope that answered everyone's question. I think everyone who had asked me about the formula would be happy now. Okay, I'll tell you what. Let's start off with some questions for you, Duncan. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Um, okay, Richard wrote this question in a long, long time ago. Actually, I think it might have been on your like first or second slide when you were talking about how much ad spend dealerships on the national average spend on TV as opposed to newspaper, as opposed to the internet. You know that pie chart? And yep. Richard wanted to know how much TV is actually cable. I, I have to ask too. Does it make a difference if it's cable or if it's just normal primetime TV? I mean, I think it would be all the same, right? Uh, it doesn't make it. I don't, that's a number we could get. Uh, I don't think for this instance it makes a difference. In, in that formula, cable and television are lumped together as one number. Um, and I think that's one of the things that as an advertiser, um, you know, we need to not separate mediums as much as we do, right? Because you don't go home and watch broadcast TV and then go home and watch cable. You watch the box that's attached to your wall, and that box that's attached to your wall has everything from uh, broadcast TV to cable to non-commercial channels like HBO. And so um, the differentiation between television and cable isn't illustrated in that. I think we could get that number four for, uh, I think you said it was Richard if you needed it. Um, and again, the main point with this is that uh, the internet is taking over newspaper. Um, it's not necessarily taking from other mediums. Yes, okay. So there we have that first uh, question answered. Richard, thank you so much. Actually, Richard wrote us some really good questions. We're going to come up to a few more of those in just a second. Um, you know that whole section of the webinar where you and I were discussing, um, you know, that, you know, certain internet managers don't look at cost per click and then other internet managers do but then other GMs don't. Well, uh, Alex, you know, you actually started something. We had a lot of different great comments from the audience but I couldn't go into them at that time. But Alex said the internet sales manager will pay attention to cost to conversion. However, the GM doesn't pay attention to that at all. So is that right? And then it, it's, no, I, I think the, the point of a cost per conversion, I, I think I've shown you that, um, you know, if we use that chart right here um, at the end of this, um, where I show the cost per conversions, um, using that somebody who types in your brand name, they already know who you are, and they're almost using a search engine as the yellow pages, right? And somebody who types in, you know, Toyota Camry LE, uh, that person would end, that search would be under this model term category. And that someone who types in Toyota Camry LE, you're going to pay a lot more per conversion for that customer than you would t someone typing in their own brand name. The, the concept here is if you're managing to cost per conversion, the first thing I would do is eliminate model terms, right? That would be one of that would have one of the biggest out, uh, impacts on lowering your cost per conversion. But the customers who are typing in model terms, it's not that they're not shoppers; it's that uh, they don't know who you are. And so, I think the model terms are some of the most valuable um, valuable calls that you're going to get because those are people who don't know who you are, and your advertising convinced them to consider your dealership and call your dealership. And so I don't think anyone should look at cost per call as the primary metric uh, because what that happens is that forces your digital marketing to be, you know, like the yellow pages only um, because we're only going to buy the keywords um, when people are typing in your brand name or maybe your, 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 your uh, franchise and city. And so I think that um, that's where I talk about none of these metrics are qualitative. They don't talk about the quality of the traffic. And so that I think cost per conversion should be something that is, um, you know, fifth or sixth down the ladder uh, as to what you should measure for a metric. So I don't think anyone should really pay attention to cost per conversion as a primary metric. Does that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. Alex, certainly if you have a follow-up question, please let me know. Um, I feel like the more I learn about this, the more complicated. It sounds simple, but it's just not easy. It just... Yeah. 
it, it's, I, it gets again, more confusing think, the more layers you look at, it seems. Yeah, I think that, uh, that that's the difficulty with digital marketing is that uh, it's very hard to discern and have a good strategy and um, in this environment where people are trying to, you know, sometimes for all the right reasons, sometimes for all the wrong reasons, trying to, um, you know, trying to sell something to a dealership, um, you know, that it's a really tough environment for dealers to be good, good well-informed buyers. Okay, well, I want to get to uh, this next question, which came to us again from Richard, and he wanted to know your opinion, Duncan, on bounce rate. Do you consider bounce rate an important metric? Uh, we do. Uh, we consider a bounce rate as an important, as an important metric uh, for comparative purposes only. And when I say comparative purposes, um, when you look at the bounce rate, uh, if we look at a website and look at a bounce rate overall, that's not what we're trying to achieve. We look at bounce rate uh, from one ad group or one keyword category to the next. Um, there's kind of a funny thing about bounce rate that theoretically, if I did the best digital marketing job possible, I would actually have 100% bounce rate. And when I say that, I mean that one of the goals in digital marketing is to get somebody to the spot on your site that contains all the information they're looking for. And so if I did like the like a utopian job digital mar digitally marketing, anytime a consumer was looking for something, I would drop them on the exact page that contained all the information they were looking for. And if we did that, people would bounce because that's all the information they need. So in, in our environment, we tend to look at bounce rate between different uh, to compare one set of keywords or one medium to another um, and not as a blanket, uh, not as a blanket uh, concept that a, that a big bounce rate is bad. Um, to give you an example, um, when you do searches, one of our tools creates ads uh, for each individual unit of inventory. And when someone clicks on that ad, it takes them right to that unit of inventory on the page. And that has a much higher bounce rate than um, a generic term where someone has to come in to a site and uh, find the vehicle. And if you just think about that, if someone types used cars and we drop them off of your home page and they have to go to used cars and they have to go search and they have search page one and they click on a car, that's four pages. If we take them right from a search engine to that fourth page, um, we've eliminated, you know, we've helped the consumer get to the car they're looking for much quickly and eliminated the need for the consumer to search through three pages. So that bounce rate's higher that time on site is lower, that number of pages viewed is lower, but that doesn't inherently mean that that visit is bad. Um, that meant that we got the customer to what they're looking for much quicker. So bounce rate is a, is a good statistic to look at, um, but it needs to be uh, looked at in comparison, you know, in, in conjunction with a lot of other statistics. Okay, you are totally blowing my mind right now, Duncan, because, you know, we've all been trained that bounce rate is bad, 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 if it's a high bounce rate. And now what you just said actually makes really a lot of sense. <laughs> so, mind equals blown. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know what, why don't we go back to the slide with your, your picture on it and your contact information okay. while we get to some of these next few questions. Uh, thank you, Richard, for a very, very awesome question. I want to get to this next question from Pat and Dahlia. They both sent in pretty much the same question. They said, what is the quality score, and how is it determined, and what are the guidelines for quality score? Is that something you know, or is that like one of those Google secrets? Uh, well, it's a little bit of a Google secret, but we could give you some insight into it. Um, so Google does not tell you the exact calculations as to how it's made. Um, and that makes really good sense because um, the same reason spam filters don't tell you exactly how they determine what's spam and what's not, if we knew, we would all game the system, right? So mm. Google does not tell you what the quality score calculation is, but they do give you indications as to what goes into it. Uh, first and foremost, um, the, the goal of a quality score is that to make sure that the ad is relevant to the user. So we all go to Google and we all type things in and we're all very, very confident that what Google returns to us is what we're looking for. Um, and if Google allowed advertisers to fill the search engine with irrelevant ads, uh, say someone's searching for 
um, you know, dog boarding uh, and we're delivering them car ads, then people would, wouldn't trust Google as much. So the goal of the quality score is to make sure that uh, advertisers are delivering very, very relevant ads as opposed to just spamming the search engine with ads. So what they use to determine it is, number one and first and foremost, appears to be the click-through ratio. Uh, the click-through ratio is the number of times that an ad is clicked on divided by the number of times that it is shown. So the higher a click-through ratio, uh, the more likely a quality score is to improve. Um, other elements are the ad copy and how relevant the ad copy is to the keyword. Um, other elements would be the landing page, uh, the load time of the landing page, the content of the landing page, and the mobile optimization of the landing page, which is something that is very, very critical um, that we've seen Google basically shut off ads that uh, take mobile users to desktop landing pages. Um, so all of those contribute to the quality score. It's a score between 1 and 10, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst. Um, and quality scores of 1 and 2 uh, really run the risk of just the ad never being shown. So uh, that's how they calculate it. Uh, again, um, we don't want to optimize specifically to quality score because some of those lower quality score keywords may be ways that we find new customers. So. Okay. Okay. Which, you know what? <laughs> Pat, Dahlia, excellent question, which leads me to my next question from Andy. And he says, so should we be going after terms with a higher quality score or a lower cost per click? Can you have the best of both worlds? Um, the, no. Uh, I think you really need, if you look at what, there's a calculation that's called impression weighted quality score. And that is the, you know, takes, kind of shows you what the average quality score by volume in your accounts are. And a typical high performing um, search marketer is going to get it in like the 4.75 range. So that's a, that means that we're in the 40% range uh, if we're doing a good job of the average quality score that we're delivering. Um, so no, the quality score is, um, is unimportant in the scope of um, a search campaign for the following reason is that the keywords that get high quality scores are things like your name and the city you're in and your franchise. And if you focus solely on that, then you're not out there getting in front of customers who, don't, who aren't already searching for you. And part of good marketing, good advertising, is to grow your business, right? Mm -hmm. Not just make it easy for people to find you. So typically, as you go down the quality score food chain, if you get into a six, a five, or a four, those are keywords where somebody is not looking for your dealership inherently and you're delivering them an ad and if they click on it and convert, uh, it's a very valuable conversion because you convince somebody who wasn't considering your dealership to do so now. So um, again, I think that's back to the idea that strategy and not metrics, um, you know, if I wanted to um, trick you into thinking I was doing a good job, I might cancel every keyword that had a quality score of six or less and your cost per click and your cost per lead would be very low, but I wouldn't be doing you any favors because I'd only be, um, I'd only be buying those yellow page type terms where people are already looking for you and not helping you find uh, new customers. So again, quality score is something that you want to manage and build a campaign to get the maximum quality score for the keyword that you're targeting, um, but that doesn't mean that a low quality score is inherently bad. Gotcha, gotcha. Andy, great question. And likewise, here's another great question from Ray. Pulling no punches on this one. He wants an answer from you. Which term would be best for an independent store? Duncan, can you help Ray out? It, which single term would be good for an independent store? That's his um, question. <laughs> wow. One term, well, I, I think that um, that typically campaigns are made up of hundreds if not thousands of keywords and uh, something like picking a single term uh, for an independent store would be difficult to do. For an independent store that uh, doesn't have the money to necessarily invest in um, a, a, a large scale search campaign, there is a tool called AdWords Express and it will allow someone at an independent store to set up um, a small budget of you know, $600 to $1,000 
and Google will actually create all the keywords for you. They'll do all the bid management for you. And um, it, it's not as sophisticated. You don't have as much control. But it's a really good option for either the, sell, the, the individual user or someone who's got a smaller budget. And our team can actually help you manage those campaigns and even provide call tracking and other and uh, dynamic inventory and stuff like that. So if you go onto our site or email me, I can forward you someone to someone who can either show you how to do it yourself or show you how we can do it for you and help uh, get the most out of it. But I would really know the, the, if you have um, if you have a single keyword in your campaign, uh, I, I think you, you're um, you, you might you might be uh, making a mistake. But if I ha I'm forced to answer the the uh, the question, it would be plus used space plus cars, uh, and that would be targeting any uh, any search for something about used cars, and I would bid it pretty low. Gotcha. Well, Ray already wrote in, thank you. And that, that does sound like a great solution. It was AdWords Express, she said. That's great. Yep. Okay, Ray, good luck with that, man. Okay, I want to jump over here to this question. Warren wrote in, how do we find out the other person's ad rank? Uh, you don't. Huh? Um, that, that, that's, <laughs> not, that's, not, that's not information that uh, is publicized or you know, it's private. We don't want your ad rank giving, being given out. Um, the way you figure it out, uh, not specifically your ad rank, is this is another interesting um, item here, is that until you move a position, your cost per click will not change. Right? So let's say you're in position two and you're bidding three dollars and you decide to bid five dollars yet that doesn't change your positioning your cost per click will be the same whether you're bidding three or five your bid does not just because you increase your bid does not mean you actually increase your cost per click your cost per click will not change until you change positions so you're never going to figure out specifically what someone else's ad rank is but if you look at one of your keywords, and what you can do is make a judgment call uh, based on what you're bidding and what your quality score is, and by increasing it or decreasing it and watching your position change, uh, you'll have an idea of what the other person is bidding and or what their quality score is. Okay, that was not the answer I thought you were going to give. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, oh, Sorry. it's easy. You click on this, and then it's right there. <laughs> no, no. They, they, the Google won't give you any information about anybody else's campaign, and I think that's a great idea because I wouldn't want, if I were a dealer, then giving someone else my information. So um, it's it's a very uh, try, try uh, a cyclical try and, and look and iterate process that uh, – if you want to, if you're not getting the position you want, you need to increase your bid until you start getting into that position, and that should give you an idea of uh, what other people are bidding or how they're buying. Uh, Warren, good luck. Man, I thought that was going to be an easy answer for you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to this question from Grant. He says, what is your position on remarketing versus pay-per-click? Um, uh, they're both great. Uh, mar digital marketing outlets for you to um, to, to tap into. Um, so it's not a question of should I do one or the other. It's a question of um, where should I allocate my budget first. Um, and I would, in that regard, allocate your mar your budget first to search engine marketing um, versus retargeting. Retargeting um, has uh, a much lower uh, ROI. Uh, it's clicked on. Uh, it's clicked for the number of times it's viewed. It's clicked on uh, significantly fewer times, uh, and it converts at a much much lower rate. Um, and so, I would recommend that you build a good uh, search engine marketing campaign. And there's a statistic in search engine marketing that the engines give you back called impression share. Uh, they tell you that the number of times uh, the impression share is the number of times your ad showed up divided by the number of times it could have shown up, meaning could have, um, if you don't have enough money and they don't show your ad often enough, they'll tell you exactly how much money you need to spend. And so if I were a dealer, I would maximize my search engine marketing budget and try to get a very, very high impression share before I moved on to retargeting. Gotcha. Mm, Grant, I hope that helps you out. Okay, 
Let's move over to this next question from Charlie. He said, okay, so we should buy our own brand name, but should we also buy our competitor's name too? Yes, you should definitely buy your own name. It's so inexpensive um, and has some benefits. So buying your own name um, is, if you looked in that, typically 10% of the cost of your campaign, which might be a couple hundred bucks. Um, the reason you should do that is because, number one, it makes uh, it easier for customers to find you. Typically, in a search result set, there, there is only one organic listing all above the fold. And so I think you should buy your own name just to make it easier for customers. Number two, since it's so cheap, it helps you track who's searching, what they're searching, what they're typing in. And number three, it's defensive. If, uh, if someone else is buying your name, it allows you to maintain that position. I'm a firm believer that we're available, that you should buy your competitors' names. Really? And make a com yeah, and make a compelling argument um, as to what the differentiation is. Uh, if you are just up 75 and say, you know, uh, you know, bigger selection, lower prices, uh, 10 minutes up 75. So I'm a firm believer that you should do that. Um, there's a specific way to do it. Um, typically, you want to move it into a separate campaign uh, because they get low quality scores and they tend to hurt the other elements of your campaign. And obviously, I don't think you should ever do it if it's in violation of your co-op program and will risk dollars at large. So if you, if you do it and you do it outside the co-op program and you're fine, uh, I think it is a good idea to do. I think the other element that you need to make sure is that you move it into a separate campaign because one of the elements of quality score is all of the other keywords in that campaign. And so it's important that you move it outside your campaign to maintain the quality score of your good keywords. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that answer, Duncan. Charlie, I hope that helped you out. Okay, moving on to our next question from James. James, I hope I'm getting this, I hope I'm understanding this question right. He wrote, is one goal for a dealer website to increase monthly contacts, leads, and phone calls? So I guess he's asking, is that something that we can do through, you know, proper PPC, I guess. I think, I think that uh, there's a, that's kind of a multifaceted question, but that should be the case, right? And so, you know, what we look at is, let's say a dealer is spending $3,000 on search, right? And they're getting uh, 100 phone calls um, that they should spend 35 and try to get 110, right? And one of the elements and the reason that we participate in the webinars with dealer on is because their sites do convert very well. And oh, that thank is, um, I think, Ileana or... Uh, Amir Ali could go through the specifics, you know, things just like psychological things like the colors of buttons, the placements of buttons. There are some things that actually encourage people to call or email more often than not. And so the goal of both your digital marketing and your website obviously should be to uh, help you get more contacts uh, with customers. Now, that being said, um, you know, uh, visits that don't result in a call or email aren't inherently poor visits, right? You know, I think we all go around and shop online and uh, look at a bunch of different sites when we're making a decision, and I think it's really important for dealerships to be front and center in front of um, customers when they're making those decisions. James, thank you so much for that question. And we have a great question from John. Duncan, get ready. He wants to know, are there any particular books or authors that you could recommend for internet marketing? So we want to know, Duncan, what does the great Duncan Scarry read when he wants to read up about digital marketing and internet marketing? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, I wouldn't read any of the websites that are out there. <laughs> and I think, it, you know, because all of the content's uh, basically a bunch of BS. No, it, you know, that's a good question. And I honestly, I don't have an answer. Um, in what? That, um, <laughs> I really, I really don't, and it's not. Um, I just, uh, I, ha I haven't read a book on it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got a pause. I don't have a good. Answer. I'll find one and I'll email you. Yeah, if you get that email, <laughs> I'll look one up and get you. But um, you know, I, I don't think we've, uh, we've, uh, we haven't developed our education or what we do internally. You know, through through reading. Uh, you know, we, we handle Why? thousands of dealers, and we look at the data and make decisions uh, based on the data, right? So, yeah, um, and you have the inside uh, track being the SMB partner with Google, so, I mean. 
Yeah, how? so I apologize. That's not a very good. I don't have a very good answer for that question at all. <laughs> okay, John, I I'm apologize. Big, I, I thought Duncan was going to knock that one out of the park. <laughs> no, I flunked out of college. I went to college for five semesters, and I got 13 credits. So you can tell that my penchant for reading probably isn't very good. <laughs> Other than that, he's a fantastic CEO, and you should believe everything that he says. <laughs> Duncan, what are you doing <laughs> to me? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, so much. Duncan, that was great. And obviously, I love the picture that you have. When are you going to put that on your business card? You should put that on, your, uh, on the I, website. <laughs> well, the, the story behind that was, so there's this uh, award thing, and they take a picture, and they say, hey, we want you to bring something that's like important to you, right? And so we have this big painting of a bear, a grizzly bear. And the concept is, you know, if you, there's a saying we have, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly bear, meaning if you're going to do something, do it well, right? And so I bring that painting to the shoot, and they, you know, I, I'm not very photogenic. I don't like getting my picture taken. And I'm standing there, and they say, listen, you got to do something different just, just so we have a picture. And they said, make a bear face. And I said, no way. You're going to take a picture and put it in a magazine. They said, listen, we promise, just make a bear face just to relax. We won't take a picture. It won't end up in the magazine. Just, just, just loosen me up. And I made the face that took the picture and put it in the magazine. They put it in the magazine, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you yeah. can never trust those unscrupulous photographers. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So next time somebody tells you to make a bear face. I won't actually, do you it. should make the bear face. It's actually fantastic. Thank you so much, Duncan. That was a really spectacular presentation. I'm sure everyone agrees. Of course, I want to remind the audience that a link to download a copy of today's webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later. Today, for your reference, please feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. Refer back to it often. I know you're going to love it. And today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. So all you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars. And from there, you can also view our upcoming webinar schedule or, of course, access any of our past webinars, too. And this webinar is going to conclude in just a minute. When you receive a short survey, please fill it out because we're always looking for great feedback from our audience. And let Duncan know what a great job he did today. And, of course, we're going to also randomly select some winners from all the completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. So you don't want to miss out on that. Now. Invitations are going to be going out tomorrow for our next webinar. Oh, and it's a good one. Oh, ho, ho. Google Places, Strategies to Maximize Your Leads. This is the one webinar you have been waiting for. I know because I get requests for this topic all the time, and we're doing it next week. Most dealers don't know how to take advantage of the several on-page and off-page factors that impact Google Places and the local listings. However, doing so can greatly increase your dealership's traffic and leads. And DealerOn's CEO, Ali Amirazvani, he's going to discuss what those factors are and how to use them to rank higher on local searches. Attendees are going to learn on-site optimization tips, off-site optimization tips, what not to do, and a whole bunch of stuff about ratings and reviews and how to use them to their advantage. So you're going to walk away with a solid understanding of what it takes to enhance your dealership's Google Plus local listing and how to greatly increase your ranking on search engine results pages. With all of the changes Google has made regarding their local listings in the past year and the integration into Google Plus local, you can't afford to miss this event. This is going to be another fabulous presentation by your friends at DealerOn. Don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held every Thursday, 12 noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And boy, oh boy, do we have some great webinar subjects planned for this year. But if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, feel free to contact me directly. Again, my name is Eliana Raggio. I love hearing from you. You can email me at eliana at dealeron.com or track me down online. I am everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, and all of the automotive social network sites. And I love hearing from you. So thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today. And we hope to see you all on a future webinar in our continuing education series. Have yourselves a good one.